Welcome back, folks, to another episode of Business from the Bass Boat on the Serious Angler Network, powered by X2 Power. And guys, today we've got a great show lined up. I am excited. Well, I'm not excited to be back in Colorado. It is cold. It was much warmer down in Arizona, although Desert Nights was uh, surprisingly cold a little bit at night, but had a good finish down there. Ended up 14th on Havasu, made kind of a, a comeback day two. Caught some great fish. Did a little recap with the Serious Angler guys on the Serious Angler show. We had Todd Klein on the winner there with last week's episode if you guys missed that. So tune into that if you want to get some of the details. I will have some video content coming with that. I got some cool, cool catches on GoPro on day two when I had the big bag as well as in practice and whatnot. So excited to dig into that. But without further ado, we're going to bring on Brennan and Drake. These guys are awesome. I have a good time with them whenever we're at a show or somewhere else, but they are with do it molds and we're going to break down something being business from the bass boat and the show that this is, we figured let's compare the pricing when it comes to high use items, right? So like to me, there's certain baits that I know I'm just going to fly through in a year. Like it's a sunk cost. It's just like fishing line. It's just, that's just seems to be like the way I fish majority of the time, like I'm going to fly through Ned heads. I'm going to fly through ball heads, swim bait heads. I'm going to fly through drop shot weights. There's probably a couple more we can get into as well, but those three specifically, I feel like I want a very high quality product and the ability to have a lot of them. Because again, I fly through them. Even if it's swim bait heads on an A rig, whatever it may be, you lose a lot of them. It's a high loss item you're generally on light line you're around rocks that kind of a thing you're fishing where the fish are so that's what we're going to talk about today let's bring brennan and drake in how are we boys hey doing good just living it up in iowa yes sir yes sir now are, are, yeah. are you guys ice fishermen at all uh, uh me definitely not it used to be in a, in a past life i was an avid ice fisherman traveled all over anymore i fish so much in the summer that my wallet needs the winter off so i don't do so much traveling anymore in the winter and try to hammer it all out in uh the months where the water's not frozen agreed heck yeah, yeah. Winter, winter's the tackle making months for us so heck yeah i i like that break um i used to be the same way brennan i used to ice fish all the time and we've got some really cool big lake trout lakes here in colorado and i'd go up in the mountains and and find little honey holes and that kind of a thing. And it's just like, man, with how, how, how busy it is in the spring and summer, it's like nice to have that break, do tackle, make tackle, rig boats, like get everything ready. Like there's almost, I enjoy that like anticipation and getting ready for tournament fishing and the, just the fishing season in general. Yeah. I'm on board with that. I like the, I like the pause and the reset, but, um, Maybe it's a little bit too long of a pause for me, maybe uh, because of where I'm positioned geographically here in Iowa. It could be much worse, but it's still a, a long, brutal winter. Um, it's like, you know, four months, depending on how serious you want to get, how hardcore you are. But uh, like half of that, two months would be would be preferred, I guess, for me. But I get that. When do you, when do you put the boat in the water? I mean, like when will you start getting? Things um, yeah. I mean, if, if like from a bass fishing angle, um, mm -hmm. late March, late okay. March. Yeah. And then it's probably off the water by late November, early December around here. And it depends on the year. It can be earlier or it can be much later. Um, generally speaking, that's about how it is here in Iowa. Right. That's like, that's fairly similar to what we've got going here. I mean, I would say at least tournament wise, I mean, you can launch a boat kind of in our Southern lakes to where they're almost deserty. Um, but like tournaments probably earliest you'll see is that mid to late March. And then, uh, yeah, November, December can be just hard to hard to get on the water because of weather and travel and that kind of a thing. But like, that's kind of about the exact same timeline, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, it's you got you to figure out a, a a winter retreat somewhere, man. You got to like, know. I know, nail, even dude, even like Lake of the Ozarks, man. Like, that's not how far would that be from you, Drake? You know, 
six hours, I think. Uh, from Cedar Falls, it might be a little bit longer. Yeah, six or seven, maybe. Do you, yeah. do, you, do you spend some time out there, Drake? Yeah, I mean, fishing in the the college series, it was a uh, it was always in the back pocket. I think we went there or Table Rock every year, and um, you know, those are early great. in the year. Uh, I, the, most of the time they'd send us to T Rock in in the spring, and then Ozarks in the fall. So yeah, um, but yeah, I've heard but... insane things about Ozarks in the spring. So I do want to get down and check that stuff out. But yeah, dude, I fish so the last two years I fished a Toyota series on Lake of the Ozarks in like early February. I mean, the one year, like it was icing up and stuff like at launch, but like, and that year it was, it was tough fishing the year after is a little bit better, but like, it's just, it, it was still like fairly good for being that, that early in the year. And the crappie fishing is what I could not believe. That lake is incredible. I mean, you just scan a forward facing sonar out to the middle of any cut. And there's like, a school of 40, a school of 100, a school of 60, like through the entire water column from 40 feet of water to five feet of water on the bank. Like it was ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. that's a cool lake. I love to, uh, like, that's, I don't know, we don't have any like panfish quality fishing here, but some of that stuff's fun to me, especially with live scope. It has made it a lot more fun. What, what you lack in panfish, you definitely make up for in trout, though. Yeah, for sure. That's that's one cool thing about your part of the world. The trout fishing is pretty cool. We do have a lot of that. We do, and uh, for whatever reason, I'm more drawn to brown and green fish than I am those slimy suckers. But they they can be Good choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, guys, let's get into a little bit. I know uh, we've both kind of done some homework here. I've I've went ahead and just got on Omnia and broke down some of the best sellers when it comes to. Um, all these different topics we're going to talk about, but it started to, uh, I think as bass fishermen, um, we just kind of spend money on, on our hobby. Like it's kind of willy nilly. Like, it's just like, Oh, like, you know, Oh, you know, I, I could use like three packs of that and I know I'm going to go through them. So like, I'm going to spend this, but like when I actually started breaking things down by the head, right? Like Ned heads, swim bait heads. I'm like, crap man for like what it is i've always thought like you know i i don't really think twice about snapping off like i'll go try right but especially if it's in a weird spot or i don't want to mess the fish up or i'm fishing as a co-angler whatever it may be if i'm like hung up with something like a ned head or a, a ball head swim bait right like i'm snapping that thing like i don't even think twice about it right like it's different than like an a rig or a mega bass jerk bait or something where i'm like man i don't really want to lose this but it starts adding up in my head once I started looking at these prices on when it was a per head basis. I was like, dang, this is more than I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. I mean, I, yeah, I'm like you, I guess. Um, you know, I get something maybe like benign in my mind, like a swim bait head, but like it adds up. And uh, yeah, you're snapping them off left and right. Like if you're fishing where the fish are, you're putting your baits in some pretty bad spots. Um, at least I am right. Um, oh, yeah. I got to believe it's the same for most people. So you're snapping stuff off left and right. Um, that's kind of where our product line comes in, right? That you can create tackle um, for many different reasons, but one of them for sure is the the cost effectiveness. Um, you know, we, we've got some numbers here. Like, you know, we could talk about skirted jigs, swim bait heads, Ned rigs. Um, Drake, you had something prepared for a Ned rig number. Like what's it cost to, make a premium Ned rig uh, for with, with a hook yeah. note with a hook. That's better than anything you're going to find on the market. See, and I think that's the, that's the other factor there, right. Yeah. Is just the, the high quality hooks. I mean, I have had a really hard time finding a high quality Ned head that had a hook that I liked. Right. And I think that is all depends on your setup, but like with what you guys have, you've got some option, op, awesome options when it comes to like an owner, or a gamagatsu hook it's a super super quality hook whether you want it to be a little heavier if you've got a heavier ned setup or something that's a little bit light wire but go ahead drake yeah well the number i had i just put together um kind of using the owner 5313 as kind of the example of the premium hook that's actually what we built kind of our ned rig midwest finesse setup around uh -huh. um, you factor that all down it's 40 cents for the hook um you buy the the bait keepers and the wire keepers and hundred packs those come out to like nine cents a piece uh -huh. um 
the lead itself, depending on where you get it from, some people can, you know, just have connections or junkyard. You can get it basically for free. But if you buy the premium lead from our site, um, you know, making Ned's 10 cents, just kind of a, a ballpark number, 10 cents per head. Okay. And outer paint, five cents, maybe. No name really. Yeah. You don't use too much paint. That's, uh, so that's such a hard one to quantify because that's probably yeah. less that than one be, penny. <laughs> Yeah, but right. with those numbers, those those oddball numbers, it came out like sixty four cents per net, right. so less than less than a dollar. Yeah. Right. No, I mean you're talking sixty cents, like, and I I just compared. So just to give you an example here of again, net heads that I have liked on the market and that are kind of top sellers. So I've got down the owner blockhead the outcast tackle perfect ned head and the ned lock z hd ned kind of ned heads a little bit heavier duty hook one a little bit nicer than their original one that i don't know for whatever reason on those original ned head hooks they're okay they're sharp the thin wire you have to be a little careful with them but they rust out on me they 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 are not a quality hook and they always end up rusting out on me so like i cannot store them even anywhere like i, I don't like them I'm done with them. Yeah, but, I, I feel like Ned's in general. That's uh, that's one head that like initially didn't demand perfection, but over time, and it didn't take long. So many people piled on and recognized, you know, how effective that bait is, how effective that like really specific presentation actually is, and right. uh, some some better stuff maybe came along. Um, but I I think. I truly believe that the Ned that we have, our mold, um, will allow you to make the best Ned rig on the market, truthfully. Market. That's not a sales pitch. I mean, like, I, I can't look at anything on the market, not bashing anybody, um, you know, not, right. not ragging on my fellow fishing industry man, but um, I don't think there's anything better out there. Yeah. No, and but, well, exactly. And, and I mean, so all of those three brands, again, your more premium net heads at all of them were between a dollar 66 and two dollars and a 33 cents per head um and it went owner at that a dollar 66 the outcast at two dollars a head and then the ned lock z at 233 per head so uh i mean right there you're three time you're getting three times for the amount of money when it comes to your net head stuff and once you have that set up, right, like once you have your lead pouring set up and all of that, like it's just continually, you're just, you're just ripping through it at that point. So, and yeah. again, the quality, the quality aspect, I think you can't overlook that side. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I can lose a pack of Ned rigs in one rock pile in about five minutes around oh. here. So <laughs> it's, yeah. I mean, can you imagine like if you took somebody fishing that's never been fishing and like, you took two dollars out of your wallet and tied it to your line and threw it out there, and you know, like repeatedly, it didn't come back, and somebody would think like you're insane, right? You know, that's the that's and we like, do it all the time, and we don't think about it. Yeah, like that's what's like it just cracks me up about about fishermen, and I'm like just as bad at it. But like, right? Even I think about just like rigging uh, before a tournament, and like I have line that's a little bit low on a reel and i'm like no oh, well I better put yep, a new it off <laughs> it's, it's, it's like dude like it's just like i mean i think one time my dad was helping me like rig tackle for something and i was like hey do this grab this and he's just like you're just gonna throw this all away and i'm like yeah man yep <laughs> i want it to be fresh <laughs> and new <clears throat> that's right we have problems but uh no man i think that's a, a good breakdown and um the quality i think you can't you can't really uh, compare when you're talking that stuff. And I think any guides out there, right. And we talk about with Andy, the serious angler crew, like I cannot imagine the amount of, especially he really likes a heavy Ned on the great lakes and whatnot, but just, I mean, rock piles and everything else. And then you put it in the hands of guide clients that maybe a hundred percent don't know what they're doing. And you're just, you're just flying through them. Yeah, no, that, that, that's, a perfect uh, example, like guides are, uh, we, we see a lot of guides in our, in our customer base, right? Um, sure. For various reasons, that being one of them, like, yeah, you, you get the right or I guess wrong clients in your boat. Um, and maybe they're great anglers and they're just not used to that, you know, that technique, let's say, but 
um, yeah, for sure. That's one of the several reasons, again, the quality and then the cost effectiveness that we see a lot of glide, a lot of guides, sorry, using our products, um, a lot. So, yeah. And I think like the other aspect in, uh, I think this is kind of more of a, on a, on a personal preference thing, but there's some kind of like, whatever it is in the outdoors, I don't know if it's just because of the way we're wired, but like, there's some kind of like pride that comes into making your own stuff, right? Like you look at like fly fishermen, right? I mean, just, they love making their own flies. Like, you know, they're, it's is it time effective no not really they're spending four hours to make some fly right or like however long it takes and um but they love that aspect of it and like then i think of like in the hunting world right like how many guys love reloading and like making the perfect bullet especially western guys out here that are yeah. shooting long range like they just want everything to be dialed in how they like it and it's that anticipation of like getting ready for the season kind of a thing yeah, there, there's definitely a, a craftsmanship um, sort of like primitive piece to it where um, people want like the satisfaction um, and maybe not. Yeah, satisfaction probably. And then just an understanding of what goes into it. They have that much more appreciation um, for what they've done uh, when right. they caught a fish on something that they made. And then, you know, the customization of it too, uh, cost savings aside, just the custom ability, being able to dial something in very specifically to a particular body water, um, anything. So th there's so much customization that you can do, um, you know, to, to make stuff um, better or stuff that's uh, never been on the market before, potentially. Right. And, and two, I think just like the cool part about having a setup to where you are able to change the hook on things is you can, if you're someone who's like, man, I want, I really want to dial in, or if you're having issues with a specific bait with your rod and real setup, like just having that ability to trial and error, I think is a cool aspect of it too. That's kind of overlooked. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And another kind of odd angle um, that probably has never played before in history ever, uh -huh. um, at least in our existence is, the need for custom tackle just due to like scarcity, like inventory Japan. on shelves. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, we all lived through it. We knew what it was like, especially in fishing, it was on fire, um, which is great, but just being able, you know, pandemic aside, let's say there's not a pandemic going on, just being able to go out in your garage and uh, crank out like 10 jigs, you know, for next week, you know, real quick. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's convenient and it's nice knowing that you can do that. Dude, I didn't even think about that. I mean, I'm thinking right now. So my my team partner lives uh, lives here with me. So we have two boats in the garage. And if we're going like to a tournament somewhere, the amount of times that we have made a last minute trip to Shields or to mm -hmm. Sports Warehouse, right? Where it's like, okay, there's not enough time to order something because we need it for tomorrow. And we're trying to get there by nine and then you get there and it's all sold out of whatever it is. But that's a really good point. It's like, I mean, especially if it's something you know you're going to use, like, hey, stock up before. But like, we're horrible, man. Like, how many times have you paid for extra fast shipping to get tackle right before a tournament? It's like, why did I do that? Like, I had the entire month to prepare for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's also great for like rainy days, you know? Like, if it's a day that just looks like it's going to be miserable to go out, you don't have the ambition to just stay in and like still still kind of have some connection to fishing like you still feel like you're fulfilling some sort of fishing purpose but you're just preparing you know so it's handy yeah i'm i'm totally that way like uh my girlfriend like gets mad at me on on a saturday or something if it's if i'm not going fishing especially this time of the year like i'm generally working a lot on saturday and stuff just because i know i'm gonna be gone for a lot of the tournament season but then like the rest of my day, like I'm like tinkering on something or doing, you know, I just feel like I spend so much time in the garage messing with tackle, getting everything ready to go because it's just like, I don't know. I like it. And I like, <laughs> uh, I like thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just sometimes go out in my garage or in my basement and just open tackle and look at it. And my wife's like, what are you doing? I don't know. It just feels right. <laughs> it's, it just feels right. Right. This is just me. Let me be. This is my own right. space. Please get leave, out of my. Leave my me place. alone. <laughs>
Oh, that's good stuff. All right, let's get into ball head swim baits. Um, this is one where I think like everyone kind of has their own specific thoughts when it comes to like the perfect ball head. Um, and, and whether that be a traditional round head jig or it be, um, you know, we were talking earlier off air, like the guppy head or, or something that maybe has some shape to it or with a stout hook for an a rig kind of a situation. But, um, there's a lot of, lot of stuff there, but Drake, do you have numbers pulled for kind of your thoughts on a, on a high end ball head jig? Yeah, I certainly do. So, and kind of going along those lines, I have like a round head jig versus a standard, just like a swim bait head. Mm -hmm. um, the swim bait one involves an eye, but for simplicity's sake, let's go with the round head. Right. Um, the premium hook of choice for that would probably be something along the lines of a Gamma 604. Mm -hmm. Gamma 604. So I use that number, um, comes out to about 42 cents a hook. Okay. Um, lead again anything close to about a quarter ounce is about 10 cents and the paint again hard super hard to quantify depending on you know, the volume that you're i'm um, doing but right said five cents for that so that comes out to 57 cents a jig head gotcha 57 cents a jig head and man i'm i'm one of those guys and i could even potentially see myself going this way on ned heads too but on a ball head jig I really am not super worried about a painted jig head. And I know some guys are, and some guys really feel that way. And I feel like there are times like maybe if it's a Demiki or something that a fish is going to come like look at for a long time, then I want an eye on there. I want some of that stuff, but like for a traditional ball head, I don't know. I'm a lead lead guy. Or if it's what, you know, I, I guess I don't have all that much preference when it comes to the color of the actual ball head jig. Yeah, for a ball head for me, it's it's either going to be plain lead or it's going to be chartreuse, and that's the only two colors. Yeah, it's be cool. Yeah, small mouth. I guess you know, if you go like walleye world, they're pan fishing too. You know, kind of scoping out. They, you know, this is business right. from the bass boat, Drake. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm out of pocket there. <laughs> At yeah. a left field, Drake. I can't believe you mentioned pan fish on here. Well, Damn. you can, you can what? You can glitter up. You know what I mean? You can glitter up, <laughs> <laughs> dude. Get flamboyant with. Brennan, that's that's right. my specialty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's reel it back in. <laughs> so good. Coming Did back. you know what I never, I, or I've seen before, but I don't know if I've done much of, but on the chartreuse stuff, like a chartreuse Ned head, I yeah. feel like could be a, a cool player. I mean, you're generally fishing for small mouth with the Ned rig. And um, that's a, that's an interesting thought. You guys messed with that at all? I, um, I do. I do a bit. I, yeah. I'm a, uh, I'll tell you what, even like, I don't hear this talked of much. I, I don't claim to have some crazy secret, um, right. but I guess I haven't heard of this, like an all chartreuse Ned rig. That's something I've been playing around with for like the past three or four years around me, just a straight chartreuse Ned. Wow. Um, so that, from the head to the bait, everything. The chartreuse. whole bait. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I had dabbled around with, uh, you know, like blaze orange, red and chartreuse Neds. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think for me, like still, it's going to be plain lead, black or chartreuse, but I will say something to just a straight chartreuse Ned rig. I don't know why, but straight it, reaction kind of a thing. I think so. Yeah. Um, and not just small mouth either. You know, I think small mouth, that's kind of like a well-known thing, but um, right. large mouth as well. Yeah. It's a killer. Cool. Cool. I'll have to check that out. I have not. Uh, You'll have to make them because I don't think, I don't think they're on the market. So <laughs> yeah. There you go. Oh, I, I, you, they've got what the actual um, Ned, like the actual bait itself. They've got that like chartreuse kind of brown back one. Yeah, it's one like one. a watermelon red with chartreuse and black flake on one side. Yep. Yep. But nothing That's the closest shrink. thing that I know of. Yeah. Cool, man. I love it. Sneaky stuff. Sneaky juice stuff. I could see that being a, a, a killer, man. Weird stuff like that. Cool. Um, well, my breakdown on swim bait heads, I took, again, some of the most popular owner ultra head, a dirty jigs, Matt Stephen, Stephen guppy head, and then just a squadron, a strike King baby squadron head. It's just a little bit a stout hook, but, um, not all that big either, but basically all those came out between a dollar and two thirty three again per head. So quite a bit of savings when it comes to it on a, on a jig head style stuff. And, um, 
another one of those things, man, like always running out of jig heads right before a tournament. They're probably, I mean, live in Colorado with clear water and small mouth and spotted bass. And I've probably, you know, I don't know, 75% of the year anywhere. Really? I go, I'm going to have a, a ball head swim bait on. Like it's just such a fish catcher, especially in like a, with a three, three Kai tech or a, even a two, seven, five, that kind of thing. Like they just, they just catch them. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it ranges, right? Like there's a different cost savings associated with every type of bait, you know, uh, you know, like what you're talking about, a swim bait head, a, a Ned rig, those are high volume items. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, where in theory, if you're doing it right, or maybe doing it wrong, you're probably losing some, right. Depending on which way you look at that. Um, I like another, another huge cost saver, um, would be in a, in like a skirted jig. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, depending on where you're at in the country, I feel like a jig is going to get you bites anywhere for sure. Um, a yeah. little more dominant in certain areas for sure. But, you know, like a average market skirted jig. They're like five, five dollars to five twenty nine. I would say, on average, pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you can build a skirted jig. Like, let's just use an Arky style jig or like a basic flipping jig, for example. Right. Um, and let's use three eighths as the number for yep. you know weight. Most common. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're you're building one of those for under a dollar twenty a piece um, when you're making them. So if you take that into consideration, the average market is five to 529 making them yourself would be 4.45 times cheaper and by your 29th jig you've broken even so wow. if you go if you go through over 29 jigs in a reasonable amount of time like let's just say two years right for um, sure which i think anybody fishing at a high level or fishing often um is probably losing call it 30 jigs in a two-year time span um so if you take that into consideration, like 29 jigs, um, you could have bought with that money a kit to make your own jigs by that point. Um, and then you're making them for a dollar twenty from then on out. And all you're doing is replacing hooks and lead and you know, keeping stocked up on skirts and hooks. So right. Yeah, and you and you are again have that ability to be fully customizable. I mean, you've got the if you want certain strands in there or some like there's just weird lakes in the country, right. Where like a certain color does very, very well, like in clear water in Western lakes, like Brown and purple does fantastic. Like a PB and J jig is just for whatever reason, it could be 30 foot visibility, but they eat that thing. Um, yeah. And, and you can create them at your own will, you know, when you need them, just go crank them out. And like, I'm, I'm a fisherman too. So I'm not like, I'm, I'm a, I'm a fisherman before I'm a, a tackle maker. Right. Uh -huh. So if I can be on the water, I'm on the water. I'm not at home making tackle. So I, I strategically do this in the winter months when, you know, like we talked about before, not ice fishing instead I'm making tackle. I take care of this stuff in the winter months. And, uh, by the time, you know, open water season comes around, um, I'm focused on that and not making tackle. Um, that's kind of one, one big thing in our business that we see too, like exactly what I just described, like the seasonality kind of to tackle making. Right. Um, we see it in our business. We, we see it, you know, like right now we're, we're on fire. We're crazy busy. Um, you know, for the most part, when the country's done, uh, I, I say country, but like most of, <laughs> most of the country at this point is done hunting. Right. Um, it's getting cold out. Like I realize in Texas and Florida, you're bed fishing right now, but sure you know for most of the country it's cold and you're making tackle so yeah and, it, and back to what you're saying there's just something to like i don't know with how much live fishing we have now right like today major league fishing uh invitational started on okeechobee but like there's something to that on the weekends like bassmaster coming on and having that just playing and doing stuff like and, and making tackle and and that is uh I agree. Like, I think, I think that's a good point, Brennan, to bring up because I think that there's going to be people out there who are like, Oh, I don't want to waste the time to save this or that. And it's like some of that to me, the customizability of a super high quality bait. And then the other factor of like, I don't know, kind of gets me excited for fishing season and I can have fishing on and just gets me fired up all around. <laughs> that, that's like a picturesque moment. Like, 
pot of coffee, Bassmasters going on, pour yourself <laughs> a cup, go out to the garage, and you're just getting mad at fish while there's snow on the ground and you're making tackle. That's right, man. That's cool. like, man, that's what dreams are made of right there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. Last one here that I have down and the skirted jig stuff that was good to bring up because that's where like real custom, I feel like, like you're, you're saying Brennan, like the more customizable things get right. Like people in the tackle industry, uh, when they're making these products, right. That's like a value add. Like, it's just like, if you're getting a truck with all the packages, right. When extra stuff gets added, like, it seems like, okay. And in the Ford, how do you go from, Forty thousand, thirty thousand dollars to forty thousand dollars in a Laria or whatever it is now is probably like sixty, seventy thousand dollars. But that difference is like very small things, but they can add quite a bit of value to it. And I feel like that's kind of the way in the fishing industry, right? Like, oh, this has an eye, and then it has a rubber skirt, and like all these additional details. And so there's just there's more um, meat on the bone to like add to stuff and that's where i think you get like the average jig price like you're saying of a quality lead jig not a tungsten jig a lead jig being five what'd you say 524 529 yeah yeah i do have one one real thing if you don't mind me interjecting adam go for it i just just did the math if you're if you wanted to sell a jig if you wanted to sell your own custom jigs which you see a lot of right um assuming your cost is a dollar 20 which isn't a fair assumption because if you're manufacturing um you're likely getting quantity discounts that'll actually bring that cost down well, let's ass let's assume you're paying pure retail right and and not getting any quantity discounts right um and selling your jig for 529 which is also not a fair assumption because it's a custom hand-tied jig and you're going to get a premium for it well, let's just assume all of that okay 77.5 percent margin wow so just think about that if you're really ambitious and you want to start your own jig factory heck you yeah expect good margin <laughs> dude everyone's got a jig guy like oh, man, yes. we all got one. everyone's got a jig guy and like i think that's another cool thing too for any any young guns out there that are interested in doing some of that stuff for your local bass club like man people eat that stuff up yep no doubt every bass club's got one every every lake has a couple that live there you know right on the lake there's jig guys everywhere jig guys everywhere yep. cool that's a that's a good point all right let's let's go into another one that i feel like i lose a million of just the way uh it goes and and it's just uh it's just part of it but drop shot weights man i've always been for the most part a lead drop shot weight guy i feel like there's not a significant for me difference when it comes to pulling up on forward facing sonar seeing tungsten versus lead vast majority of the time I've got a lead drop shot weight. There are certain times if it's, I don't know, I don't even know a time. I, I still seem to always find my drop shot just fine on forward facing sonar with, with lead, but I generally throw a pretty heavy one, but anyways, let's get into drop shot weights. All right. I got the breakdown. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you were, if you were going to go with the, the heaviest one, um, like a three eights, which is sure. kind of egregious, but, um, right. Yeah, and then that would be 12 cents for the lead. Essentially, okay. if you purchase it from us, 99% pure lead. Um, and then throw a, a swivel on there. Swivels come out to like, you know, 10 cents a piece. Mm -hmm. uh, you're essentially paying, you know, 22 cents a drop shot sinker. So, um, you know, what kind of like averages and stuff did you pull up for? Uh, yeah. So, so I have like between the three, I got, I got a, again, just going off of Omnia, the most kind of sold ones. There's a, X zone a Voss and the Matt Luna drop shot heads or drop shot, not heads weights. They all worked out to be kind of in that 50 to 65 cents range. So good savings there. I mean, cutting it in half and some uh, really a third when it comes down to it. So um, another cool situation. What's, what's kind of cool hearing this from you guys too. something I didn't really expect, but it's like, okay, that makes, makes sense. The hook is kind of the most important most expensive part when it comes to that the ball head and the the net heads like i mean very small scale right we're talking 40 cents but it's like wow that's a good portion of the total cost of building that thing it is yeah um in a it, it, it just it all depends on what quality of hook you're comfortable with um right 
you know, that there's all these different brands, right? And, and we, you know, I feel like most people know most of them. Um, you know, most of them have a good product that's out there, but they all have different kind of uh, price points that they like to offer, right? Um, I would say for a premium bass hook, and I'm, this could be a 90 degree, this could be a, a 60 degree, 30 degree, this could be a 1X, a 2X, a light, um, you can expect for a premium bass hook to, you know, 15 to 40 cents a piece okay. is pretty common. Um, and, and most of them honestly are going to favor that 15 cent, you know, maybe in the mid twenties. Uh, but that's a premium hook. Like that's, that's a great hook. That as good as it gets. Put in your jig. Yeah. That's as good as it gets. You know, if you're put, if you're spending almost 50 cents on one hook, that's a, that's a damn good hook. Right. Um, and, and a lot of people elect to do that. Um, you know, which is one benefit to making your own, um, you, you know, you find too, that in time you become kind of a snob. Um, <laughs> so like you, like, you know, I'll be in a buddy's boat, even fishing a tournament, like I'll pick up a jig or something that's in his boat and I look at his hook. I'm like, dude, like, I can't, I can't let you do this, you know? <laughs> um, so you become a snob, you get accustomed to just building the best stuff and I don't know. It's awesome. It's good. It's good to know how to do. And it's, uh, good that there's affordable stuff out there that allows people to do it. You know, we're, we're like really the only ones that we do, uh, that do what we do. Um, so right. we kind of have a service in the market to offer products that allow people to do this. So no doubt I could see, I could see how when you're super dialed on what every hook on the market looks like, and you know, every hook and kind of how much it flexes and this and that, like, you are just even in your own if there is if there is a bait that you're buying that you aren't making right like that there's a high quality production thing like you know already you're like okay this isn't the right hook for this or i don't really like this just because of that again that education piece of of building your own stuff out yeah yeah i mean you get an appreciation for cost and just i, I mean just the anatomy of baits understanding um why things work the way they do like why particular bends of your hook and, and angles of the line tie, like how that all starts to, um, you know, play a role in, uh, and, and apply right. in different situations, you know, like weed guard angles, everything. Um, you just have a totally different understanding, um, and, and a better standing, better understanding at that of, you know, tackle and, and why things are made the certain way. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I think another thing we really haven't touched on too much in this is, is kind of the confidence factor of things. Like a lot of people say, you know, confidence is like 50% of the battle. You know, if you're, if you're going to hook up and uh, potentially, you know, a tournament winning fish, you, you know, one of our slogans is when pride is on the line, you know, you don't want to hook failing, you know, you know, in a, in a big time situation. And Brennan, you know, he's a big proponent of the, the Gamagatsu one or the one, one, one is a, uh, one of his, you know, favorite hooks because the O'Shaughnessy style bend with it. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, you put, I don't know, Brennan, you can speak for yourself, but I think if you put a, a standard, you know, just round, round bend hook in your hand on a swim bait head or something like that, you might, you know, not have as much confidence in landing the fish. Yeah, I would agree. Um, you definitely, be, because you have an understanding of what's out there, like you're probably more apt or willing to try it. Like, um, you know, just pick up a 25 pack of new hooks that you want to, you know, give them a run, see, see how they perform for you, see what confidence you do or don't have. Um, so yeah, you, you get to kind of test a, a bunch of different stuff out, um, see what's out there, see what works for you and, uh, stock up on them, build a ton of them. Once you find out what works for you, you load up. For sure. Yeah. And I think what's cool about that too, is, is everyone's setup, right? I mean, like, so many people use a different rod power and length and how that rod bends and what kind of line size you're doing and how much drag you have set. And there is just such, you know, as you, as you get deeper and deeper into fishing, like my tournament partner and I do different things completely. Like I, I probably should not be throwing the same head as he is in a lot of situations because his drag is very loose on a spinning rod and he is very comfortable with that and very good at it. Whereas myself, like I want to get a good hook in him. 
And generally my drag is still loose enough. There are times when I feel like I need to back it off a little bit when I'm on super light line, but like all those things make a difference. And that's, what's cool about this is it's like, just like trial and error with anything else, you can really dial it in for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And then once you get it figured out, um, you can replicate it a lot, a lot of times over again, um, for not a lot of money. So no, no doubt. Cool. Well, dude, you mentioned there the, uh, Gamagatsu one, one, one. So why if for folks who I guess don't know what that is, I'm looking at a picture here of it. It's got a little bit different bend than your traditional, uh, bend there, but what describe, I guess, why you feel like you, you get a better hookup ratio with that. Yep. So an, O'Sha an O'Shaughnessy style bend is, uh, just trying to think of a way to describe it for people that might just be listening, but an O'Shaughnessy style bend is, is similar to a round bend hook. Um, but it's got, um, an angle inward, um, in between the point and, um, where the round bend, the conventional round bend would come back down to the shank. Um, so it's got a little bit of an angle there. So once you get the hook point started, um, you know, and, and that hook lodges itself in there and it bends around. Once it's past that angle, it's it's really locked into place. I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I'm not going to go out there and say like on record that like you're not going to lose fish because it's fishing. You're going to lose fish. But um, right. I think it's been proven uh, just in time in history um, that the O'Shaughnessy is probably the most effective bend, if not uh, if not one of them. So um, I like the O'Shaughnessy a lot. It works well for me. The 111 specifically has a really long cone on the point itself um so it does have um more like surface area for the fish's mouth to have to pass through before it gets to the barb okay um, past the barb but it's so sharp um and so like needle point at the end that you don't have to worry about it um it you know very little friction you get quick you know penetration it's got a good barb so once it's set in you're, you're golden um it's also forged a little bit um, not the entire hook, but part of it. So it's really strong too. Um, the one elevens are really hard to find. There is a victory one Oh one, 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 um, which is essentially the same thing. Um, this is a hook that, yep. That's the one eleven right there. Okay. So guys on, on do it molds website for those of you listening on the podcast and not the YouTube video, we've got the Osh. I don't even, dude, I don't even know how to say that. Oshana, say it O'Shaughnessy. O'Shaughnessy. O'Shag right. Hennessy. O'Shag Hennessy hook. So I see what you're talking about. Like right here, there's there's an, an angle kind of coming back. Yep. And it's that, it's that would... pretty minimal. Like if if you don't know what you're looking for and like you saw them side by side, you know, uh, O'Shaughnessy next to a round bend, like you know, somebody that's not paying close attention, like they're they're not gonna tell the difference. It's not like crazy substantial, but it's just enough to make a difference. Um, so I, like this is this hook, for example, I, I was in Texas in November and I caught, uh, a bass that was like nine and a half pounds, almost nine and a half on a one aught, uh, victory one on one awesome. one and on, on, like little tackle, eight, or what? Yep, on, on like a 2.8 inch Kai tech, um, awesome. you know, so like on a spinning rod, um, you know, tackle rod, everything was like in sync right like it, it wasn't on accident i knew what i was getting myself into so i had drag set and everything right but um that's awesome it's a one-aught hook so like if you think about the wire diameter um of a one-aught hook like on average um you're not going to be putting that up against the nine and a half pound bass in most cases like most people wouldn't do that but because it's forged um you get away with that and still maintain that really, really light wire. So you get awesome hook penetration, you keep them hooked and they don't bend out because they're forged. So that's why I like the one Oh one, one, one. I think it's the best swim bait head hook out there. Mm. Okay. And when you say forged, um, I think I know what that means, but, but go through that, I guess. Yeah. So there's one part of the hook that's essentially stamped. Um, let me see if I can find. Here, okay. So for people watching, you can see, um, so here's like a regular um, round bend hook in a, in a football jig. Okay? Um, forged means that they would come in right here and it would actually get pressed on this axis here. 
and it would get, you know, kind of crunched inward under heat and pressure. And that just like solidifies more strength in the hook. So the shank itself is more rigid. Um, it's stronger. They're not going to bend nearly as easily. Um, could you bend it? Yeah. Are you going to bend it on a fish? No, not unless, you know, you, you've got the completely wrong setup. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool, man. Learning so much. That, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And, and to land a fish like that on a one out hook is, uh, that's cool stuff, man. I mean, that is a tiny, tiny hook. It is. Yeah. And I, I mean, I gotta believe, like I said, there's good stuff out on the market, but like, if you're looking for what that was, what caught that fish, which was a three sixteenths ounce, uh, round head, basically, or freestyle jig. So it had 3d eyes and a one aught hook. Like if you're getting a one aught hook, on the market on what's out there you're probably not getting a hook that you'd be putting up against a you know double digit fish most days or, or one that you wouldn't want to right right and that just shows kind of the the cool customizability of, of stuff and um where did you have that fish hooked uh right in the roof of the mouth in about 20 foot of water on live scope um right in the roof of the mouth but it, it and it was down there deep i mean um, you know, when a fish of that size wants to inhale a bait, they, you know, come up behind it on live and just barely yeah. open their mouth. And by the time you set the hook, it's almost coming out of their ass. So um, that's true. Yeah. Dude, that's, it's like this last, uh, I, man, I had a good reminder of that. Um, on Havasu this last week, I had a six fourteen eat a trap, yo-yo in a trap and like, you know, I hate hooking a big fish on a trap just because there's so much leverage and that thing mm -hmm. just, you know, just like you just have memories of like a giant, like especially on like Rayburn coming up with like a freaking trap hanging outside of his mouth. But treble hooks this, and big fish don't mix. No, especially oh yeah. No, I, I just was like so nervous when I hooked this fish. But man, I was on this school of fish in like a cut in the grass in a deep grass pocket. And I was just like I had in practice i had spent 45 minutes trying to make a fish bite and i finally got one to do it and so i was sitting there i had caught one coming into there and i saw him and i'm like dude those are those same fish like i'm gonna make them bite so i'm picking up rod after rod throwing a jerk bait over their head throwing a swim bait over their head throwing an a rig over their head and i was like man in practice i had them follow a trap but i never had one eat it so i picked up a trap and i'm just yo-yoing it and like sure enough like i'm like three of them are coming and i'm like oh boy here we go here we go and finally dude like I lift up and it's just like a, my, my trap is just going down on slack line. And it was like a freaking jig bite. Like it was like, just smoked it. And I leaned back and was like, Oh no, like this is a real one. And sure enough, like got it going to grab the net, got it in the boat. And dude, that trap was so far down his like throat instantly, you know? And it, the second I felt something, I set the hook, but like, it's you exactly right. Those big ones, like it, it goes from, out in the water to the back of their throat in T minus zero seconds. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't take long. I mean, when those big fish, like they get a mouth of that size, it's just a giant vacuum and it's such little effort for them to move. You know, I don't know how much water, but a lot in a short amount of time and <laughs> anything, you know, like a three sixteen sounds head, for example, like that's just like taking it to a shop vac, like it's gone, you know? Oh, especially. Yeah. Especially something like that. Just like zoop. <laughs> yep, she gone. That's freaking awesome. Well, guys, um, this has been great to break down some actual costs on stuff. And uh, I hope folks are taking advantage of, of this stuff. What from Do It Molds do you, can you guys share it all? I know we've got the classic coming up, we've got iCast and all kinds of stuff. Um, and like you said, you're in your busy season. This is like the time when people are making tackle, but you guys have anything to share for 2023 potentially kind of stuff into 2024 this early or, or what do you guys want to say there? Um, I cast stuff is sort of off limits. That's, that's unfortunately most of what we got, or fortunately, I guess, um, we do have some stuff dropping during the classic, I'm sorry, the week of the classic. So the Monday before. Okay. Um, there will be some new product launch. There's a soft bait mold, uh, that will be launching. And then there is three new powder paints coming. So, um, 
nothing maybe earth shattering, but uh, we do have some heat for iCast. And then, you know, we like to kind of surprise and delight with uh, some new products kind of off cycle um, when everybody's minds are sort of fresh into tackle making, you know, offer them some new colors and stuff, which uh, still pretty exciting. So that's really what we got in the short term. And then, like I said, uh, iCast will have a, a whole plethora of new products. Cool. Cool. Yes, sir. Exciting stuff, boys. Well, let's start with uh, kind of how I like to wrap up all the shows for folks. Um, I'd like to basically see your your biggest largemouth, smallmouth, spotted bass. We'll do both of you guys where you were and what you caught them on. But Drake, let's start with you. All right, smallmouth. Brennan's Brennan's already getting ready to rip me on the. Yeah, he's gonna say bed fish in a smallmouth. I got yeah, turn away. I got a turn away. I need around bed fishing. We just showed up. And, I got nothing you know, wrong with that. Don't let yeah. don't let Brennan even come near you. <laughs> okay, all right, appreciate it. Yeah. So we'll deduct was, we'll deduct half a pound because it was on a bed. Because it was well, on a bed. Good one. It, right. it was five eleven on a certified yeah. on a certified scale. So well, not certified, but where was that at? Um, in Webster, South Dakota. That just whole South Dakota. Um, it's kind of the plains area or whatever. Yeah, People refer to as the glacial lakes over there. Uh huh. So uh -huh. That, that was a a daggum stud. Um, honestly, I think largemouth wise, it might have been in high school. What? One second on that smallmouth. I know you were bed fishing, but how'd you? You didn't snag it, right, Drake? Like, what? How'd you catch no. this fish? Come home, man. <laughs> Come home, <laughs> man. <laughs> no, it was actually it. It took a little bit to get them to bite, and honestly, we didn't really figure it out until we dropped some, started dropping some some nacos on their heads. So, mm. and um, gotcha. so that was. I mean, that's kind of a, just a bummer, you know. I'm not not super like proud it. of that one, but it was a giant. So uh, you know, when people was ask it in me, a derby or no, what's that? Was it in a tournament? Not, no, not okay. in a tournament. No, okay. gotcha. but um, yeah. And then going back to largemouth, I think that was in high school. Didn't have a certified scale or nothing with me. Um, probably ballpark to be six, six and a half. Okay, um, heck yeah. But but it was just on a bladed jig. Oh, so. Stud. Yep. Cool That's man. A good old bladed jig, running the bank parallel. Oh okay. yeah. No boat or nothing, just high school fishing. So I love it. Somewhere, yeah. somewhere there close by. Yep. Oh, it was actually back home in, in Des Moines. So, okay. you know, that was a, that was a good one. Nice. Um, and then I think spotted bass. My You've been to Table Rock, so you probably caught a good one there. Yeah, my personal best spotted bass is actually the first one I ever caught. And it was like three fourteen on an okay. A rig, and I was just completely baffled. So uh, those I, got, I got pretty bad. lucky. They're yeah. so cool looking. <laughs> Yeah, that one was in a derb. So, heck yeah, yeah, you know. nice, love it, yeah. love it, Brennan, go for it, man. Um, my my smallmouth is six twelve, and that's from Sturgeon Bay. Oh that's a God. big one, and that that was actually on uh, on the exact same thing that I caught my personal best largemouth on. That was on a a jig that I poured a freestyle jig. Um, okay. Yeah. Gosh, I want to tell you that was three thirty second ounce and about oh six foot of water in Sturgeon Bay. Um, pre spawn, of course. And then so what bait? What bait is on this jig head? Uh, that was a three inch spark shad in IU. Um, it, it was like a magical day. Um, you know, just like a textbook day on a Great Lake. Uh, terrible, terrible weather. Um, wind blowing right into a obvious point, and there was a massive school there and it was like every cast almost at times and uh yeah we got 28 and a half pounds that day um oh, and we had we had to leave God. because the waves were getting so bad and we had a boat right in so we left but probably could have cracked a 30 that day no joke dude that is ridiculous but that light of a g 330 seconds ounce yes sir yep so it's shallow small mouth like near the spawn where they were they were kind of just up and around yeah, they were within, I mean, I wouldn't even say within 24 hours, they were within the right sunlight conditions to being up on a bed, you know, um, like I have no doubt that instead of that wind that day, if we would have had, um, you know, bright skies and, and little wind, they would have been up in two foot of water getting ready to make beds. So, dude, that's wild, but you yeah. like that super light head. So it's just, I mean, just like floating coming through like very, very light, real and slow kind of a thing very slow yeah yeah like painfully slow 2500 size reel um just 
eight pound, eight pound uh, braid. To, I think that was probably six pound uh, fluoro, just like as slow as you possibly can. Every now and then just touch the bottom, um, you know, up there generally that time of year, you can't touch the bottom too much um, in most areas or you get zebra mussels or you get uh, some bad moss in some areas. So touch the bottom every now and then try not to get any, you know, crap hung up on it and bring it through the zone and you were getting a bite every cast. So um, pretty silly. Wild, dude. And then cool. largemouth, uh, just recently, this past November, actually, I broke my personal best largemouth, and that was the nine and a half. And it, it was like nine four or something. I don't know exactly. Nine five, I don't know. But um, that's that's my new personal best. On the same bait, spark shad. That was, a, uh, sorry, not a spark shad. It was on the same freestyle head. This was a 316th instead of 332nd. And right. then that would have been a 2.8 inch Kitek in Rose Pro Blue. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Dude, those 2.8 inch Kitex have been catching a lot of big fish lately. For sure. Yeah. It's uh it's a killer. I mean, when they're when they're eating little bait or they're just being, you know, on ray holes and not and not eating. Um, <laughs> and, and you have forward facing sonar, that that is huge too. Um, you can do some crazy things. Right. Cool. What about a spotted bass? If I've caught a spotted bass, I don't know if I have. So um, it could be, it's, it's very small if I've got one. Um, I've never, I've, I've messed around on, uh, on the Ozarks when I was younger. Um, I fish like Bull Shoals and Norfolk Lake. I oh, think cool. they have spots. Yep. Um, I fish some t stuff in Texas that definitely have spots, but um, it's never That's been like a, list item for me i guess um maybe someday if i become that big of a snob i'll try to catch a giant spot but for the time being it's not on the radar <laughs> gotcha man gotcha well maybe uh i'll be in california twice later this year fishing the toyota series at the delta and maybe we'll have to uh figure out something go up to like shasta or go try and catch one of those california freak ones that, that would be wild yeah that fun. would be wild Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Although I, I like those spotted bass. I, I'm, I don't think my biggest is, I don't know, three and a half, something like that. I, I haven't caught a real big one, but like, they're just such a cool fish to me because they, they're just so fat and aggressive and just cool looking. I like the look of them. Yeah. They're mean. I know they have a lot of, uh, you know, in terms of like just aggression and how hard they fight it, I think they have a lot of parallels to a small mouth. So that, right. that intrigues me. Um, just wish that, around here at least they got a little bigger but it's all right can't win them all that's right that's right cool well boys uh thanks for coming on this has been a blast talking do it molds and for folks interested guys do it molds website's awesome you can go through look at everything and there's there's great kits to get started too when it comes to uh pouring and making sure you have everything that you need um a great idea and, and a cool way to customize some of your stuff. So if anyone has interest, check that out. We'll have all the links in the show notes for sure, as always. But um, without that, you guys have anything else tonight? Uh, I don't. Yeah, like like you said, we do have kits available. Um, everything's already ready to go. We have two different versions that, um, let's say you already have a melter and you just want a, a killer deal on you know supplies to make X bait, um, including the mold, we have that. If you don't have a melter, you don't have lead, you have nothing and you want to start from scratch, we have kits for that too. And uh, I, I want to tell you most of them are under $150 and that'll get you get you well on your way. So that's, that's your first 100 jigs for 150 bucks. And then after that, they get a lot cheaper. <laughs> that's right. Awesome. Drake, you got anything else, man? Tempt the kits. I like it. All right. All right, boys. Have a good rest of your night. And thanks, guys, again for tuning in. Thanks, Adam. We'll see Thank you guys. You.